We already heard in yesterday in Dominic Zagid's talk why you might care about Green's function methods. Um, so thankfully, I won't have to do a lot of motivation. But maybe just to recap quickly, two bullet points from a physics point of view of why these methods are essential. Uh, their Green's functions encode response properties of physical systems. Um, so, uh, well, this is the natural language for uh, uh, trying to compute various sorts of quantities um, uh, that you can't otherwise get your hands on easily. Uh, and also, uh, they're physically measurable. So, uh, the Green's functions that you can compute are things that you can actually measure experimentally. And so, they're somehow real in some sense that, well, this is ample motivation for, from the physics point of view to, to try to compute them uh, and, and compare them against experiment. Uh, but this talk is going to be more aimed toward a mathematical audience. So somebody who's maybe not comfortable with this language, uh, that is the language of field theory, many body perturbation theory, and Green's functions, which is really, uh, in a very broad sense, I would say the lingua franca of modern physics, and not just in condensed matter. So also in, for example, QCD or other quantum field theories, um, you get a lot of mileage out of just kind of making your peace with, or learning, alternatively, depending on your point of view, this uh, way of thinking. And uh, it's very forbidding if you don't know it, but when you do know it, you can look at a paper very easily and you can spot, like, oh, here's the action, and I, now I understand what, what this model is doing, and you can spot common threads that uh, underlie a lot of different uh, you know, seemingly very different on the surface kinds of directions in physics, in condensed matter, and beyond. So uh, when physicists say all these scary words, like quasi-particle, renormalization, or renormalize some renormalized quantity, like a mass, uh, screen Coulomb interactions, frequency-dependent Hamiltonians, Grassmann fields, these are all, I think, very unrelatable from the point of view of just writing down the many-body electronic uh, Schrodinger operator. And, um, well, this is the language that they're thinking about when they talk about this. So if you're comfortable with the many-body Schrodinger operator, uh, all this stuff is kind of hard to understand what it means. But when you do, there's, there's tremendous reward. Uh, and so I would suggest the following roadmap for somebody who is uh, uh, kind of, let's just say, a generic applied mathematician without much physics uh, background. Uh, so first is to understand the formalism in a setting that's very comfortable, uh, namely classical statistical mechanics or classical field theory. The second step is to sort of make your peace with the maneuvers that you need to uh, transplant this formalism to the settings that in this workshop we prim primarily care about, that would be quantum many-body physics. Uh, and that maneuver really is the path integral, and specifically coherent state path integrals. So, uh, well, maybe you already started making your piece yesterday, in the talk on quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, but unfortunately, the path integrals that we'll see later, very briefly, are less peaceful even. So uh, it's not a matter of, say, being like, ah, OK, I'm happy with some infinite dimensional Lebesgue measure or something like this. No, it's really much, much more weird than this when you talk about the coherent state path integral for fermions. But uh, OK, eventually, it's very fruitful to kind of onboard that perspective. And then uh, once you've done this, these two steps, then you're free to go out in the wild and you can scan papers easily and talk to people and, uh, and have some kind of productive interactions and uh, see what, what arises and you'll be you know, well on your way to understanding it. So, okay, the talk will proceed in the following fashion. So first I'm gonna talk about perturbation theory in the classical setting. I'm gonna talk about ludinger ward theory, which is a non-perturbative kind of uh, a framework that uh, recovers a lot of the ideas that arise from a perturbative point of view. Uh, and then the third point is I'm going to talk about in the classical setting, very concretely, what various Green's function methods correspond to uh, that also appear in quantum many-body setting, but here in the classical setting they also have analogs. Uh, okay, the second part of the talk uh, will be maybe less friendly, but that's uh, it's hard to fit everything in one talk. Uh, the first part, we want to go from many-body Hamiltonians to path integrals and sort of start to make our peace with this. Then we want to talk about what Green's functions are in this setting and some of the key points of their structure uh, in the equilibrium setting. Um, 
And then this will lead us to a very natural question that's resolved in the classical setting, but very much open in the quantum many-body setting, which is this issue that even came up yesterday about the domain of, of a, this fundamental functional of interest, the Ludinger Ward functional. Uh, okay, so we'll begin with the classical stuff. Um, so the, the motivation today for these uh, classical field theories, which you could call Euclidean lattice field theories, if you want, is as a kind of formal warm-up to the quantum many-body problems. But uh, there, I should just mention they're, they're of interest of, on their, of their own accord. So uh, there's f many famous classical statistical mechanical models, such as the 5-4 theory, the Ginsburg-Landau theory, that can kind of fit into this framework. And I forgot to put a citation, but people have applied uh, DMFT, for example, in the setting or the analog of it. Um, uh, but also, maybe more surprisingly, there's some interesting recent work uh, from Tim Brickelbach's group at Columbia on something called vibrational DMFT, which uh, can be interpreted so th uh, as fitting also into this framework, uh, applying DMFT to kind of classical, uh, uh, classical field theories. Um, and, um, uh, but we, we won't really talk about this. This will just be purely formal. Uh, we won't talk about any specific models, really. Okay, so we begin now with the perturbation theory. And our point of departure is, uh, well, we're going to do classical statistical mechanics. So, of course, we write down a partition function. And, well, physicists will always say that the partition function encodes all of the important features of, of a statistical mechanical system. Uh, but this elides an important point, which is for, to... Uh, recover the interesting things you care about. You really want to think about the partition function as a function of something, so some model parameters. And here, the important, uh, well, the thing that it's going to be a function of is this matrix A. So we're talking about uh, Gibbs measures or Boltzmann distributions, which have a quadratic part uh, in the energy function and then some other part called the interaction. So without the interaction uh, there, this this becomes a trivial model. It's Gaussian. And for all intents and purposes, anything uh, involving matrix algebra with these matrices we consider easy and so-called non-interacting. This U term could be arbitrary, and it, may, it takes, you know, for example, even sampling from this probability distribution proportional to this uh, expression. It makes it, in general, hard. And uh, this will be the analog of the many-body term in the quantum many-body setting, whereas the, this Gaussian part is the analog of the single particle term, like the hopping matrix and second quantization. So we want to think of everything as kind of a functional in some... The functional is a little bit of a misnomer because these are really just matrices, but uh, it's a useful misnomer. Uh, and we want to think of everything as functionals of matrices, and here the, the matrix is this single particle matrix A that determines the Gaussian part of the interaction. And, okay, once you've written the partition function as a functional of this matrix A, you can write down this free energy, which is the minus log partition function. And this is a useful thing to do because if you take a derivative of it, you, um, uh, with respect to the matrix variable A, you recover precisely the two-point correlator, which is just the matrix of second moments. So this guy here, omega, as a function of A, if you know it in principle and you can take its derivatives, then you can compute uh, uh, two-point correlators, which are also called Green's functions, for a reason that I'll mention soon. Uh, and, uh, okay, for the purpose of this talk, let's just imagine that the problem we want to solve is computing G. So, uh, in general, you could definitely do it if U is zero, but if U is not zero, then this is suddenly, in general, a hard problem. So, everything that we do, we can come to from the point of view is saying, I, I want to know G, so I want to understand, I want to compute the two-point correlator. Okay, so in the non-interacting case, G is just ca called G naught, which is uh, the inverse of A. So this is just a Gaussian integral. Uh, uh, tells you that yeah, the, this covariance matrix G, or the two-point correlator, is just the inverse of this matrix A, assuming it's positive definite. So when U is... Uh, is zero in this non-interacting case. This statistical ensemble is just Gaussian, and not only can we compute the two-point correlator, but we can compute any polynomial moment in terms of the two-point correlator via Wick's theorem, 
which is probably best illustrated by an example. So if you want to compute the, the expectation of some uh, monomial uh, uh, like this, you write down all the possible ways of pairing up uh, or pairing off uh, factors in this monomial. So i and j, k and l is one way, i, k, j, l is another way, etc. Each of them uh, gets a term, and that term uh, you write, uh, uh, well, you kind of just distribute the, the angle brackets over the expression, and you uh, write everything out. So this x i, x j, that's the two-point correlator with, uh, indices, at indices i, j. Um, the non-interacting two-point correlator, which is we have a name for, that's g naught i, j. And so all these moments can be written out in terms of g naught. And um, OK, this is the starting point for, for perturbation theory, uh, is Wick's theorem. Uh, okay. So far, so good. So we're going to consider uh, sp specifically uh, a kind of interaction that mimics formally the structure of the Coulomb interaction in quantum many-body physics, um, specifically of the density-density form, although it could be generalized, and that form is, is this. So there's some matrix V, which is you can think of as like a Coulomb kernel, and uh, it specifies this interaction uh, as the, well, by this expression. And uh, <clears throat> the idea of perturbation theory is to view this lambda as kind of a parameter, which you want it to be 1, but you want to view 1 as a perturbation of 0. So in other words, you want to take derivatives uh, of all the quantities that you want to compute with respect to this uh, variable lambda, and then uh, you get a big Taylor series in lambda, and you set lambda equal to 1, and then, okay, that's perturbation theory. Uh, but it's very painful to do because there's a lot of terms in the Taylor series. And so uh, we'll come to that in a second. But uh, uh, whatever those terms are, they're always going to be evaluated as Gaussian polynomial moments. So just for example, let's say we wanted to compute the partition function, z of z. Uh, you, you take your uh, density, you uh, expand e to the minus u, using a Taylor series for the exponential. And, uh, okay, I'm missing an integral sign here. But once you actually put the integral sign in, you see that all of these, this is an infinite sum of terms. And each of these terms uh, involves a power of u of x. And if you FOIL everything out, uh, it's ultimately a big sum of monomial expectations with respect to the Gaussian measure e to the minus a. And we know from Wick's theorem that all of those moments can all be computed in terms of g naught. Uh, so, Okay, in principle, we can compute perturbative expansion of anything only using the non-interacting two-point correlator, g naught. Uh, there's a note point of caution, which uh, is actually worse here in some sense than in the fermionic setting, which is that this series that you get actually has a zero radius of convergence. There's a question? Okay. Yeah. So what are the regularities that would need uh, for g to Can you speak up? Yeah. Uh, can you listen to me? What are the regularities we need uh, on u? Uh, sorry, you are the regularity? Yeah, like, is there any condition on u that we need? Well, this is u. So just, just imagine that this is u. Uh, the, it could be taken to be more. I, I, I think the, oh, the question was, is there some condition on the regularity of u? So for concreteness, just take u to be this, where v is a positive definite matrix. And this will suffice to do all of our manipulation. It could be more general, but this is, yeah, let's just go with that. Uh, OK. So yeah, this series, Taylor series you get actually has zero radius of convergence. You can think of this being the case because imagine that lambda was slightly negative. Then this u would actually have negative growth. And this uh, probability distribution would not be normalizable. So somehow if you went even slightly negative with lambda, this Nothing makes any sense. But for slightly positive lambda, what you get is an asympt called an asymptotic series, uh, which is, uh, for the purposes of doing perturbation theory formally, fine. Uh, and uh, OK, so the series that you get is organized in terms of these things called Feynman diagrams. So now this is what we're going to try to uh, say something about. So Feynman diagrams are a way to do perturbation theory in a the classiest possible way with the least amount of pain. And then we're going to basically keep trying to make it less and less painful 
and then miraculously some interesting thing will happen, uh, and uh, that will be bring us into the Ludinger Ward stuff. So, okay, how do the Feynman diagrams work? You have two kind of building blocks. So one are these lines, call, often called propagators, and in particular it's, the, it's called the Bayer propagator here because we're going to do something to it. That's B A R E, um, and that this you, these are actually you can think of them as tensors. So if you like tensor networks, these Feynman diagrams will be tensor networks. This has two indices i and j. This has four indices, and uh, well, that makes A a matrix. It's just the two-point, non-interacting two-point correlator, the bare propagator, and B is, uh, well, it's this tensor right here, which encodes the Coulomb interaction. And when you write down, uh, so in your Taylor series, you'll have, uh, for every term of order k, you're going to kind of just throw down on a sheet of paper k uh, of these. And then you just put them, yeah, just, just draw k of these. So let's say three of these on a sheet of paper. And then all of the terms in the series will, be, will correspond to all the ways of connecting up the open legs to each other to get like a closed diagram. For example, uh, that would, that's the case for certain kinds of quantities. For other kinds of quantities, you may want to leave some of the legs open. So there's different... Uh, conditions based on what you're computing the pertur pertur perturbation series for, but uh, okay, we'll talk about one in specific, uh, and that's this is the, per uh, the, the perturbative expansion for G itself. So remember, G is the thing we wanted to compute in the first place. So let's try to compute it uh, just by just by Taylor series expansion. And uh, the Feynman diagrams for G have this kind of form. They have two open legs. And the order, again, it corresponds to the number of squiggly lines. So this, these are the first order diagrams for G. And they correspond to all the ways that you could write down something with one squiggly line that has two open legs and the, other, the rest are all connected somehow. And there's only two ways to do this. These are the two ways. Uh, the first of these will appear many times in different flavors. But this is a kind of a Hartree term. And the second term is a Fock term. And if you write down what these tensors correspond to. So this J uh, here is an, this open leg contributes a propagator. This one also contributes a propagator. So there's three propagators here. You should have three uh, factors of G naught in each of these terms. And um, they'll become more familiar later, but you can write these out uh, just by, you can just do the sums out for contracting uh, the, the, these tensors. And uh, you get an explicit expression up to first order for the expansion of G in terms of G naught alone and the Coulomb kernel B. Uh, okay. So uh, that's first order, and here's second order. And already there's a lot of diagrams. So uh, these correspond to all the ways of kind of connecting up open legs, except for two of them, uh, in a way, moreover, that makes the diagram connected. Uh, with, uh, with two squiggly lines. And yeah, there's already a lot of these, and we'll actually ultimately kind of simplify perturbation theory to the point where there's really only two diagrams that matter at second order, although ultimately there's some kind of combinatorial explosion. Uh, okay, so the first move, uh, yeah. Uh, is there a clever way when working with these diagrams to see that you actually got all of them in the perturbation theory? Or uh, well, you have to, yeah, so this isn't being super careful, but of course you can prove that, uh, you know, you could, there's some combinatorial arguments to say that these are, you know, these are all the terms that you need. And yeah, so that's perfectly rigorous. Uh, and um, there's also something I didn't mention, which is each of these has a kind of prefactor, which has to do with uh, how, how much symmetry there is internally in the diagram. And this can all be, uh, uh, okay, this can all be done carefully, but yeah. Uh, okay, so we want to kind of organize this expansion in a, a more streamlined way. And uh, this motivates this important concept called the self-energy. So the self-energy, which is always called sigma, is, it's, the, it's the sum of one particle irreducible amputated diagrams. So I'm going to have to say what I mean by that. Amputated will mean that these external legs here don't actually contribute an, an extra factor. So they're just kind of open uh, indices left on... Uh, Kind of, there are the external legs just to the squiggly line, and there's no additional uh, propagator leg here. So that's what it means to be amputated. Otherwise, they look the same. And one particle irreducible means that we can't cut them into two pieces by cutting, uh, by, by, by 
removing one line. So this one is not one particle irreducible. I can, I can cut it into two pieces by cutting this line right here. Uh, okay, so uh, why is that, yeah, why is that the right category of diagrams? Uh, uh, and what is the self-energy? I have to define it. We'll do so now. And it's defined most naturally via, although we'll redefine it later, uh, this thing called the Dyson equation. The Dyson equation is, says that sigma is the thing that makes this matrix equation hold. So G equals G naught plus G naught sigma G. Um, and in diagrams, you can write this equation diagrammatically like so. So G is called, gonna be called the bold propagator or the bold line. Uh, it's, it's indicated either by a bold line or a doubled line for clarity. So the double line is G, the single line is G naught, sigma is some matrix, uh, that makes this equation hold. And uh, you could equivalently define sigma just by solving, so multiplying on both sides by G naught inverse and G, you solve for sigma and you get, it's the difference of G inverse and A. And A is G naught inverse, so this is a difference between the bold, uh, so somehow, the, uh, well, in an, yeah, so it's a difference between the inverse of the non-interacting propagator and the inverse of the true propagator, or the bold propagator. And this kind of category, is, it, it somehow is measuring how far you are from being non-interacting, in some sense. But it does much more than that. And uh, a cool thing you can do is you can take this equation, you can plug it into itself. So on the right-hand side, there's this G, and you can just take this equation recursively and plug it in for G on the right-hand side. And you keep doing it. And you get this infinite series, which you could also call the Dyson equation, which is that G equals G naught plus G naught sigma G naught plus blah, 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 et cetera. And diagrammatically, that looks like this. So you never kind of close the equation by putting a bold line on the right. You have this infinite series on the right with only bare lines. Uh, and this is what motivates this one particle irreducible thing. Because we have, we have a, a diagrammatic expansion for the bold line. And what this sum is saying is that in that diagrammatic expansion, uh, I'm going to categorize that expansion as a sum over several different subcategories of diagram. And these are going to be the ones that are one particle irreducible, so that can't be cut in the middle by a line. These ones can be cut by, uh, by, by cutting some line in the middle between whatever our expansions for the self-energy are, et cetera. And so the sigma, sigma here is, uh, somewhat, I mean, again, it has to be proved, but intuitively, it's the set of all possible diagrams that don't, that you can't cut by cutting one line. And in that way, every diagram that could be cut with by cutting one line is, is actually furnished by this expansion uh, b by taking the, the irreducible diagrams and connecting them up in a, in a string where each of these connections could be severed between a, any pair of self-energy diagrams. Okay, so concretely, the first order diagrams are the same because none of our first order diagrams were one particle irreducible except for the fact that these legs are amputated. So there's only one factor of G here. Uh, this should have been G naught, sorry. Uh, there's only one factor of G naught and this looks already more familiar from a hartree fock point of view. So this sigma is a matrix. The left term is called the Hartree term. This is a diagonal term that you get by taking the di diagonal of G, which is kind of like a density, and uh, multiplying it by this Coulomb kernel, and then putting that on the diagonal of a matrix. Meanwhile, the second term is an entry-wise product, which is like the Fock matrix in Hartree-Fock. So this self-energy has a Hartree contribution and a Fock contribution, just like Hartree-Fock. Uh, yeah. The indices in the sum correct? It looks like there's an L. Say again? Are the indices in the first sum correct? It looks like there's an L. No, they're not. There's no L. Yeah, ignore the L. Good catch. Um, yeah. Second term is supposed to be right. Uh, this one. Yeah. Oh, I should have had sigma ij on the left. So entrywise sigma ij equals just the entrywise product of v and g. But isn't it, is it the is it the second diagram? Is it the same what? Diagram. The second drawing. It's this one. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, why is there like this line? I don't understand why it's there. Why it's not just this one? Yes. Does so the one is Vij. Okay, so th this this line doesn't actually contribute anything. This is this tensor with Vij uh, delta, you know, Ik delta Il. This Gij here is uh, is this 
And then, yeah, so the deltas functions make it such that there's no actual summation happening. It's just, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So at second order, we've already reduced the zoo of diagrams down a bit, but we're going to reduce it further. So we removed all the ones that weren't one particle irreducible, but there's still something undesirable. Like, look at this diagram, for example. You could think of this one as being kind of like the Hartree diagram with this circle here connecting this squiggly line to itself in a loop. But instead of that, uh, that line circling around, you kind of replace it with some insertion of some other diagram that we already knew about. This diagram here being the Fock diagram. So it's kind of like you took the Hartree diagram and you kind of like uh, uh, kind of grafted on uh, a Fock diagram somewhere. Uh, uh, and in some sense, there's a kind of redundancy in the expansion, and this is what we can kind of reduce. Uh, so the idea of this is what underlies the so-called bold diagrams. And, uh, uh, okay, the, the, the idea is as follows. So take this Hartree diagram, and imagine that instead of that bare line, the bare circle, you plugged in the bold line. And then you plugged in the expansion for the bold line itself. Then you would get this kind of series where you had substituting in for this bold circle all of the possible uh, uh, bare diagrams for, the, for G inserted in, in, in place of the bold line here. And this covers all the bases like this, right? So this one is obtained in this expansion, uh, and so is this one, right? So this is also comes from an insertion of some, some uh, diagram we already knew about on, on top of the Hartree diagram. This one is, corresponds to an insertion of a Hartree diagram into a Fock diagram. So, okay. If we do this, then uh, uh, and we, what we'll get is actually uh, uh, a reduced complexity in our expansion, where now there's only uh, two terms in both first and second order expansion, but this line here is now the bold line. So imp implicitly, we've kind of resummed diagrams to infinite order, which is a mysterious thing to do. Uh, and in this expansion, the bold line is, its, is itself precisely the thing we're trying to compute, G. Uh, and, uh, okay, and the only second order diagrams that survive are these two diagrams, which are, okay, uh, simple, and they're the ones that appear, for example, in GF2 calculations. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so we've, these bold lines implicitly, you can think of as uh, we've having resummed these infinite categories of diagrams uh, and kind of, uh, compactified them into this reduced dictionary. Uh, but there's uh, now what's happened is that we can't literally compute this expansion because G, the bold line, is precisely what we didn't know. G naught we knew, but we can't literally compute this. And it has to be computed self-consistently. Uh, and so what, what does that mean? So first of all, if you carry out all the combinatorial arguments carefully, this suggests that the self-energy itself depends only on G somehow. In other words, it's a functional of G given a fixed interaction U. The functional of G here meaning that it doesn't depend independently on A, the original um, term in your action that specified the model. So the self-energy can be viewed as depending only for fixed interaction on G, not directly on A in any way, or on, G, or on the, the, the bare line, if you, if you like. So, uh, okay, that's kind of interesting. Um, and, uh, okay can see our paper on this for a rigorous argument justifying this, um, but we're also going to uh, 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 justify this, this point about it being a functional of G in, uh, in a non-perturbative way. Uh, so this exact functional does exist, sigma of G, in this classical setting, as we'll show later, but it's not possible to evaluate directly. Uh, very much like the, you know, the exchange correlation functional, except the difference here being that we can compute these perturbative expansions to all order, uh, which you can't necessarily do, or at least not without some, okay, you can't, can't do this directly for exchange correlation functionals. So, uh, uh, so what do you do then in practice? Let's say we have uh, 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 an ansatz for this dependence of sigma on G, which we could get, for example, just by taking all these diagrams up to second order, and that defines an ansatz in terms of the bold line G for the self-energy. Okay, whatever that is, you plug it into Dyson's equation, and then you just solve Dyson's equation self-consistently for G. And this defines a Green's function method. So this choice of your ansatz for sigma 
finds the Green's function method. Uh, and we'll go through a few options for that in a, in a second. Um, in principle, if you like, you could solve this by kind of running this Dyson iteration, maybe doing some mixing or something to make sure that it converges. Where you take G, you plug it into your self-energy ansatz, take A minus the self-energy, you invert it, and you get G again. If, if you get what you started with, then you know you've converged. Right? So uh, you've satisfied the Dyson equation. Okay, so what have we achieved at this point? Uh, so combinatorially, we've kind of achieved a vast reduction of the number of diagrams we have to keep track of, which is, which is not nothing. Uh, so, but th there's also something weird that happened, which is that we, um, you know, we did this infinite resummation, and somehow now this, this kind of Green's function method is very different from just directly evaluating you know, a Taylor series, right? We're doing something kind of different here. And uh, what, is, what have we achieved by doing this? Uh, it's, it's hard to say definitively, but uh, he, here's a, a challenging point that you have to kind of wonder about if you're trying to justify why you did, why you went through the pain of this. So if you, did tr if you do truncate your bold expansion for sigma, say, to second order, and you solve the Dyson equation for G, it will turn out that your order of accuracy in terms of like uh, the order of accuracy in lambda, the perturbative coefficient, uh, isn't any better than if you just did a second order bare expansion of G. So both of these are sort of second order accurate. Um, they both uh, have, you know, are accuracy, accurate up to the O of lambda, the three terms, uh, uh, when lambda is small. So uh, it's not clear that we did anything productive besides kind of uh, cut down the supply of diagrams we have to worry about. But we, we still did. So it's better to use the bold diagrams than the bare diagrams for other reasons. And I'll just give one answer about why. So, uh, well, this has to do with kind of a limit of infinite volume where uh, you get a certain kind of divergence in evaluating these diagrams. And typically in condensed matter, and uh, for example, when you're doing, you know, solving lattice models, like the Hubbard model is, a mo is supposed to be a model of real materials, but also if you're doing, you know, some kind of ab initio effort where, where you have a finite number of basis functions per unit, unit of volume, then you're thinking about, uh, you're thinking about a limit where you're not worried about the continuum limit. So th this is somehow fine physically. This isn't the interesting thing you're worried about. And in that limit, you, get, you might get something called U, UV or ultraviolet divergences, which are very much an issue of worrying about in more fundamental quantum field theories. But here we're more curious about thermodynamic limits, so the limit of large volume. And here you may get a different kind of uh, divergence in your diagrams. And the difficulty is that your diagram itself in this limit may even fail to exist. So you have this expansion, you know, that's second order accurate in some sense, in finite, you know, for a finite dimensional model. Uh, but uh, it, there's some kind of catastrophe that happens when you, you go to the thermodynamic limit. Uh, this bare diagram, uh, if you think of A as like a differential operator, its inverse may be, uh, will have only algebraic decay. Uh, so if A is like a Laplacian or something like a graph Laplacian, which is often a case of interest, uh, then uh, the G naught, it, it may only have algebraic decay off the diagonal. And when you just try to evaluate these diagrams, you just do these summations, you may see that that's not good enough for things to, for things to converge in a controlled way in this limit. Um, by contrast, G typically, unless you're at criticality, will have exponential decay. So even if G, G naught doesn't, the presence of this interaction will actually keep uh, G local. And so these diagrams may converge more robustly in this limit. So this is one point of view on why you would prefer bold diagrams to bare diagrams, is the G, the G diagrams somehow actually, uh, they actually sort of conserve the true locality of the system, not the artificial locality that may or may not be present in the, uh, in the bare line, G naught. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so now we come to Lodinger Ward stuff. So uh, our goal is to gain a non-perturbative understanding of these developments. And in particular, we want to interpret this bold diagrammatic expansion because there was some suspicious footwork of resumming these diagrams. So, okay, now we really use this partition function as a functional. Uh, and uh, remember that it was defined this way, omega of A, was, uh, this free energy which is, whose gradient with respect to the matrix variable A was the two-point correlator. So this omega is, uh, it's concave strictly and smooth. 
So you expect its gradient to define a bijection onto its range. Uh, and this bijection will be between symmetric matrices A and positive definite matrices G. So a two-point correlator is a, co it's a covariance matrix. It's always going to be positive definite. So the range is kind of, the, the idea of what the range should be is sort of clear. And you could plug in, as long as U has sufficient growth at infinity, for example, in this Coulomb-type interaction, any symmetric matrix that you want uh, for the domain of omega. And this gradient then actually defines a bijection uh, between symmetric matrices A and positive definite matrices G. And this is, I mean, okay, this can be proved rigorously in the language of convex analysis. And moreover, the, the gradient can be inverted uh, kind of semi-explicitly. It's the gradient of what's called the concave conjugate or the Legendre transform of uh, this free energy functional. And that's defined right here. Uh, so this F is the, is the Legendre transform of omega. And by these convexity arguments, this is well defined. And these gradients invert each other. So the gradient of F inverts the gradient of omega. And they take us back and forth between this, this correspondence from matrices A, defining the model, and uh, co covariance matrices G. Uh, so this Luttinger ward functional is defined in this setting by taking, you really just have to ignore the factors of two. Uh, yeah. So don't worry about factors of two. I'm just trying to be correct, but there's certain conventions. But essentially, we take this conjugate functional f, and we subtract off a piece that would be what f is if we were in a non-interacting setting. So this piece that we subtract off is the exact value of the functional in the case that u, the interaction, is 0. And that defines this so-called Luttinger ward function. So it, yeah, again, this term, these, these things we're subtracting off are precisely chosen to ensure that it's uniformly zero in the non-interacting case. But interestingly, as a byproduct of this, this term we subtracted off, uh, so it diverges toward the boundary of uh, positive definite matrices. So this is the trace log or log determinant of, of a positive definite matrix. If any of the eigenvalues gets close to zero, it blows up. So there, this, this F functional actually has, diverges at the boundary. And what, what you subtract off here is precisely the thing you have to subtract off if you want to get something that's continuous up to the boundary of the domain, positive definite functions. So in fact, phi extends continuously up to the boundary of this domain. And its behavior on the boundary is described in terms of, uh, in fact, lower dimensional Leninger ward functionals. This is not so important necessarily. But the fact that it cont extends continuously up to the boundary is kind of important because it allows us to justify um, the bold diagrammatic expansion as a perturbative series uh, for phi, which we'll come to in a few moments. So, okay, recall this is the Luttinger ward functional. And, okay, that's the math. That's kind of an interesting mathematical motivation for subtracting off this term. But that's not the real, the, the, the original motivation, which is that this is rigged precisely so that the gradient of the Luttinger ward functional is the self energy which in particular establishes that the self-energy is a function of g directly, because phi is. So uh, why is that? You just take this equation, and you take its gradient, uh, ignoring factors of 2. Uh, you get a gradient of phi, which we're defining now to be the self-energy on the left-hand side. The right-hand side, the gradient of f, remember, was a. Uh, it's the a that corresponded to g. And uh, the gradient of trace log is, is, is just the inverse. So you have exactly the Dyson equation. So the, the Dyson equation is rigged to be solved precisely by subtracting off this term and defining the self-energy to be this thing. And this, is, this was our previous definition for the self-energy, so that it's the same thing as before. But now we're viewing it as a functional of g. Uh, yeah. And uh, OK, so that's neat. Uh, and uh, then. You can show, uh, thinking of sigma as a function of g, and then adding in the extra argument, which is the interaction, uh, scaled by some perturbative parameter lambda, uh, you can then interpret these bold self-energy diagrams as an asymptotic series, once again, but an asymptotic series for the self-energy function. Uh, and moreover, uh, you can get an asymptotic series for the Luttinger ward functional with respect to this perturbative parameter by taking uh, your uh, self-energy diagrams, which you call sigma k, and kind of tracing them against g. So diagrammatically, what happens is here were our bold self-energy diagrams. 
if you, if you trace these against G uh, up to some normalizing factor, you just, you just sew up the diagram. So you're taking these two open legs and you just connect them by a bold line. So this Hartree one gets sewn up to be this dumbbell diagram, which you could also call Hartree diagram. This Fock diagram gets sewn up to be this closed Fock diagram, et cetera, et cetera, for the second order diagrams as well. And so all of the second or Luttinger Ward diagrams up to second order are, are written here. That you get them by sewing up the, the uh, self energy diagrams. Uh, okay, so the, the, a kind of a weird thing has happened, which is that we uh, defined the concave dual of the free energy and subtracted this divergent part, motivated by subtracting off the non interacting contribution. And then diagrammatically, this corresponds to so-called renormalization of bare to bold diagrams. And I don't know. I just think this is cool. Because a priori, these seem like very different things, but they happen to do the same thing. And in fact, although it's more complicated, there's a similar intuition that could be extended to so-called bold screen diagrams, where you um, replace the squiggly line with a bold squiggly line uh, uh, by doing similar tricks where you have you think of diagrams as being one particle irreducible with respect to cutting the squiggly line. And uh, this can also be motivated analytically in a similar fashion. And this is the purview of the so-called psi functional as opposed to the phi Luttinger word functional, which uh, uh, okay, it's a more sophisticated topic, but it's relevant for interpretations of methods like the GW method, which we can also interpret now. We'll come to it right now. Uh, so, let's do, so let's just, we're going to talk about three methods concretely. Uh, Hartree Fock, GW, and DMFT in this, yeah. Yes, uh, so uh, I have a naive question. So, uh, considering this kind of subtraction of divergence, so as far as I learned, uh, this uh, the whole idea of like uh, Dyson uh, uh, green functions is to show the uh, equivalence of Schrodinger formalism and like Feynman formalism. I was wondering if it's like uh, also, I mean, this kind of uh, tricks that we subtract the divergence can be done in uh, Schrodinger formalism. And if somebody has done it, the results are again completely same or they're different. Uh, I'm not sure that I followed the question. Uh... Okay, so it's, it's, it's not that. Okay. It's also very hard to hear. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Well, okay, maybe we'll, we'll see if that's resolved. But, uh, uh, okay. um, Excuse me, you didn't hear me, or uh, yeah, my question was not like. Uh, I can like barely hear, so I'll try to listen. Very ah, okay, carefully. okay. So, uh, can you hear now better? Still, the volume is low. I don't think it's your yes. fault. I think it's our fault. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if yeah, you... maybe, maybe we can ask questions in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it seems yeah like I can ask this is consistently okay, has a low volume. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, we'll return. Uh, so the sigma. Okay. So the so Hartree Fock uh, uh, method. You can just set. You just do the Green's function method. Um, that I described before in a general sense, but replacing Hartree Fock, or replacing the, just a general onsets for self energy with this Hartree Fock onsets. And there's in the Hartree Fock matrix, self energy matrix, there's this diagonal part from the Hartree, and there's this entry wise product that's the Fock contribution. Um, and uh, okay, you just do what, you, what I said in a general setting, but you do it here. Uh, now, more excitingly, uh, we can. Uh, We'll do something more exciting now. So this is the GW method. So the GW method is defined by taking all the diagrams in the bold expansion for phi, the Luttinger Ward functional, of this form. So uh, these kind of uh, uh, this, these, this ring of bubbles. Uh, so this is certainly not all diagrams that exist in the Luttinger Ward expansion, but it's a subset of the diagrams. And uh, this series is an infinite series, so we've already resummed to infinite order to get the bold line, but we're going to resum to infinite order to get something else. And th this summation can be done explicitly uh, because this is essentially a geometric series. In the self-energy land, the, the GW expansion looks like this, where we cut one of these uh, lines and leave it open. Uh, so, uh, okay, this was what we wanted to sum. You can do it explicitly using a geometric series. Uh, 
This, the first term here is hard tree, by the way. So the hard tree kind of stands alone, and then the rest ha have this geometric character. Uh, you can do the sum explicitly, and you get this expression for the GW Lodinger Ward functional. Uh, when you take the derivative, the GW self-energy consists of the hard tree piece, minus this piece that looks kind of like a Fock piece, uh, but where the V Coulomb kernel has been replaced with W, which is the so-called screened Coulomb interaction, defined like so. In fact, this screen Coulomb interaction, even if V has algebraic decay, this would typically have exponential decay. And so this is, uh, well, this is the screen Coulomb interaction according to GW, but the, the so-called psi functional is all about defining this uh, W in a completely non-perturbative fashion, um, where there's a notion of a screen Coulomb interaction independent of any perturbative expansion. Uh, but the, the cool thing is that, yeah, this can uh, kind of deal with divergences due to the slow decay of, of uh, V uh, in your diagrams. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay, I already said this. So now the last method is, okay, DMFT, which is a little bit of a misnomer here because there's not going to be anything dynamical about it. But in the original setting, it stands for dynamical mean field theory. Uh, but, okay, there's still a perfect analogy between DMFT here and DMFT in the usual setting of interacting electrons. So uh, this, this will be a different approximation for the phi functional. That, um, uh, it has a very different character, so it's worth checking it out. So the, what we start by doing, really, uh, this is more generally called clustered DMFT or cellular DMFT, CDMFT. We suppose that our indices can be partitioned into a bunch of disjoint fragments. Um, and we also have to assume that our interaction is kind of block diagonal with respect to this partition. So there's no, so the interaction matrix V doesn't directly couple any of these, these uh, sites that are partitioned into separate fragments, although the, the, uh, the A matrix might. And the, the DMFT approximation is defined by just taking the sum for every one of these block diagonal pieces of G. So on every fragment, there's a block, there's a diagonal block, GK, and we can evaluate the explicit, the exact Lodinger Ward functional of lower dimension on that block. So the, the, the DMFT approximation involves an exact, I'm calling it phi sub frag to indicate that it's um, of a smaller size for the fragment, but this is the exact Lodinger Ward functional of smaller size evaluated on the blocks of G, the diagonal blocks of G. And when you take this derivative, uh, you see that the, uh, the, this, the, approximation uh, that accompanies this of the uh, self-energy is block diagonal, uh, where each of the diagonal blocks is the exact self-energy uh, evaluated on the corresponding diagonal block of, of G. So uh, there's, you, this can be corrected to, to account for long-range interactions with diagrammatic corrections, such as in the hartree fock plus DMFT or GW plus DMFT methods but I, I won't talk about this. I'll just mention at a high level how you can solve this. There, there's a question of how to solve this uh, that's not clear a priori, which is that, I mean, the idea is that there's these, you're using this exact functional, which is kind of hard, but the idea is that it's easy if these fragments are small enough that you can somehow brute force the problem. But uh, it's still not obvious how to directly run the Dyson iteration, because you need to evaluate this exact self-energy functional of the block. And you could do this, but you'd have to solve some uh, you know, self-consistent loop to do this for each of the blocks, and then you'd have to embed that within some broader self-consistent loop. So there's actually kind of an implicit way of formulating the Dyson equation, which is, um, well, it's more uh, pertinent practically, which is that for every cluster, you find what's called a hybridization matrix which is some extra piece that you add to the local part of A, such that when you find uh, the local, so this G here, maybe it's not the most clear notation, this G is taking the local uh, uh, Green's function specified by this effective single particle, uh, uh, single particle matrix A, K, plus the, this compensating hybridization term. The hybridization is chosen so that when you take uh, this, uh, well, maybe I should rephrase this. So uh, w when you take, uh, okay, let me start again. So this G here outside the brackets is the local 
uh, g. So it, it assigns to the input um, the, uh, the local Green's function that you would get by solving this restricted problem on the smaller domain where you have this compensating extra term in the, uh, in the single particle matrix. This gk on the right, it has to be the, the kth diagonal block of a global g, uh, which is defined according to the Dyson equation using the self-energy from DMFT. So these hybridizations have to be picked exact, to exactly match uh, the blocks of the global G according to the DMFT Dyson uh, equation. Um, and uh, with a few pages of derivation that can't really show in the interest of time, it can be shown that uh, finding the hybridizations that achieve this, which can be done by a self-consistent loop in terms of the hybridizations, where all you have to do is solve these forward maps, G of AK plus delta K, uh, if, you, if you solve this formulation self-consistently, it's equivalent to solving uh, the kind of more ge uh, general Dyson equation formulation according to the DMFT onsets for the self-energy. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, DMFT uh, uh, relates to something called impurity problems, which also have an analog in the classical setting, which I'll mention now which is that uh, you, if you, you can consider a certain kind of interacting problem where you have a bunch of variables and the energy function of these variables uh, has a sp special form, which is that there's an interacting part, but it only involves the first several variables associated to some fragment. And then the rest, there's some interaction that, there's some non-interacting term that couples the fragment variables to some auxiliary bath variables, but this term is only quadratic. And, uh, well, this kind of impurity problem, well, this is what an impurity problem means here, and it can be solved uh, more simply than a general uh, interacting problem of this size. And one way to see this is that you can kind of integrate out these extra bath degrees of freedom, which later we'll mention that how it's done in the setting of the path integral. And when you do this, you find that this global problem with fragment and bath orbitals maps to a smaller effective problem where you have this sure complement matrix A minus V, E inverse V, transpose appearing as the, um, as the non-interacting matrix in this smaller effective problem. And uh, it can be shown in this setting and in more general settings, and this has been well, well known at, at an informal or kind of physics proof level for a long time, that the, uh, the sig this self-energy for the original large impurity problem can be recovered from only the self-energy for the small fragment uh, via this relation between the two, which uh, says that the large self-energy is in fact, well, very sparse and only has a non-zero block associated to the fragment. Uh, okay, so that's gonna be it for the classical part. Maybe uh, put any questions in the audience, the local audience. Okay, so now we want to talk about how to. Uh, sure. Let's see what else. So, I can I can I ask a question about the classical part? Yeah. Can you hear me? Somewhat better. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, you said you were going to address this question of the domain. Yeah. So, the, okay. So in the classical setting, there's no question, but I'll come back to it later. Uh, well. In the. Well, so is it that, you know, any uh, positive uh, symmetric matrix? Yeah, that's right. So the domain is the positive definite matrices. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And then does that mean that there always exists an A? Yes. So there's, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between positive definite G and symmetric, not necessarily positive definite A. And is that true in infinite dimensions? Uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, formally yes, but we didn't prove this. But there's no, uh, uh, I'm just going to say yes. Yeah, but it, it would require some, you know, lifting of the finite dimensional limit. Uh, but there's no like formal obstruction the way that there might be in the quantum setting, which is what we'll come to later. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, okay. So, uh, 
Okay, so now to quantum stuff. So fortunately, others have already introduced second quantized Hamiltonians. Uh, and for simplicity, I'm just going to consider ones where the dense, this uh, interacting term is a density-density operator, uh, operator by analogy to what we already considered. And it doesn't, it's not really a necessary restriction, but may as well do it for simplicity. And um, so these, these can be either bosonic or fermionic annihilation operators, which lead to path integrals of very different character. So what we're interested in this setting is the so-called, well, again, the partition function, but it's a quantum partition function because it's a trace of some of this thermal operator, e to the minus beta, uh, h tilde minus a chemical potential contribution, where beta is an inverse temperature. And, uh, okay, I didn't specify the domain of z, and we're going to come back to that. Uh, uh, so what is the coherent state path integral? Uh, there's no way I can derive it but I can, in this time, but I can tell you what it is. So it writes the partition function as a, as a sort of classical partition function, over uh, uh, variables with an extra time dimension. So, uh, and these, this time dimension will have a period, or its periodicity on, with respect to the, the interval beta, which is the inverse temperature. And I say it's a pseudo-classical partition function because the action in the partition function will be complex. So meaning that there's, uh, uh, well, it's not literally a probability distribution anymore because the exponential of a complex number is not a, a real number anymore. So, or it's not a positive number anymore. Okay. So, okay, it's an integral over, uh, over paths with components numbering according to the number of sites in the model, 1 through m, and with a time variable 0 to beta. Um, and this partition function, you can think of it as being uh, this integral is with respect to some infinite dimensional Lebesgue measure on the space of paths uh, that are periodic. And uh, the action consists of two pieces. The first is the so-called non-interacting piece, and the second is the interacting. And uh, uh, yeah, this partial tau term will actually contribute an imaginary piece to the action. So that's what prevents this from being uh, classical. And um, the, for that reason, the analogy to classical statistical mechanics is only formal, but it's still enough to recover the same diagrammatics formally. So for an expansion with respect to this matrix V, uh, there's very similar formalism of diagram diagrams, uh, which I won't recom recapitulate, but I want to just explain what the objects are even that you're trying to, trying to compare. So, uh, but first, the fermionic case. Uh-oh. Let's see. Good catch. Okay, thanks. So in, in the fermionic case, uh, we have a different kind of path integral which is, it's not even bad because there's a complex action, but it's much more deeply weird. And this is because it's an integral over so-called Grassmann number-valued paths, uh, which we'll denote xi i. Again, with indexed by the number of sites in the model, that's the number of annihilation operators. Um, and the thing about these are that they're not really numbers at all. So you think of them as formally anti-commuting symbols that r respect these formal integration rules. But otherwise, there's no way to sort of concretely realize them, except at extreme cost on a computer. And uh, formally, you can do, still do things like Gaussian integration. And formally, also, everything beyond that is still hard. So it's the same kind of formal si situation where we have these two pieces in the action. The first piece is quadratic with respect to the, the Grassmann field, just like the bosonic one was. And this piece alone is fine. We can do the integrals formally fine just like we could do a non-interacting, uh, you know, class, solve a non-interacting classical model where there's no interaction. The second term makes everything uh, difficult. Okay. So in spite of the fact that this Grassmann field is kind of an abstract concept, this, is, this kind of object here, this quadratic action, uh, is, is, is still a friendly in some sense formally. So the notion of absolute value here is a purely notation. Yeah, so it's just xi. It's just this times this. Right. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so it's just xi bar times xi. Yeah. I was wondering if someone would say it. <laughs> Good catch. Why is there no what? Uh, because this is a matrix. So the xi. You can think of this as a vector-valued path, and when I star it, I just transpose it and 
and take the bar of all of the entries. Okay. So this is like a quadratic form inside the integral. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's great. People are paying very close attention. Uh, okay, so single particle grains functions. So what's the analog of the thing we did before? Uh, we want to, so I'll present this in a way that's like the formal analog analogy is clear. So this is not how, like in a physics textbook, someone typically is like motivating why you care about Green's functions. So I'll try to actually go in the reverse direction, say why, you know, how this connects to something that you actually care about, like for kind of physically intuitive reasons. Here, just formally, what I want to do is I want to do something similar to what I did before, which is do a functional derivative. So take my log partition function and take a functional derivative with respect to A, and then get a two-point correlator. And we can do this, but uh, we have to do it on an extended space. So the space of A that we're going to consider is going to be larger in some sense than the space of all possible static Hamiltonians. In other words, it's not the space of all hopping, possible hopping matrices H. It's going to be something weirder than that. So this is a static Hamiltonian that we started with, but we're going to kind of extend the class of physical problems we're interested in to have these so-called, um, well, not static or frequency-dependent terms in, within the path integral, within the, the single particle uh, operator in the, in the path integral. And so the most general thing you could write down for the action uh, that's quadratic, uh, and we're just going to be grasping now from, from now on, so we're, we're sticking to fermions. Um, so the most general quadratic form you could write down in the, in the Grassmann path is something of this form. So you have this matrix valued with indices i, j, kernel A of tau prime tau, and that's the most general quadratic form you could write down over the Grassmann fields. And uh, just like A here is the most general quadratic form you could write down over uh, real, you know, just, just real vectors, right? So, uh, okay, this is the natural thing to do. And uh, the reason is when we differentiate with respect, we'll do a functional derivative with respect to A tau prime tau for the exact same formal reasons as before, um, you know, mutatis mutandi for the Grassmann variables, we get a two-point correlator. So uh, what I'm not saying yet is this A is kind of, it has the right dimension, uh, of, so it has the right dimension uh, of kind of the size of space we have to consider. But what I'm not saying yet, and which is not known, is whether there's still some physical constraint. So this would be like an open constraint that uh, A has to satisfy in order to define a sort of physical model. So we'll come back to that. Uh, but whatever that constraint will be, it should be like an open constraint, right? It should be some boundary in the space of A. It, it's not like some small subspace or some manif submanifold of A that we need to restrict to. It will be an open constraint. So the two-point correlator, um, uh, which is, can be thought of as a statistical expectation of this gra two, two, you know, second-order Grassmann variable moment, uh, is derived exactly the same way as a functional derivative. And in the static case, uh, uh, we can interpret this in a physical way, which is, will bring me back to the kind of standard way of introducing Green's function. So in the static case, this kernel, A, it has the partial tau, and it has this um, instant, instant time contribution, uh, with H minus mu. Uh, and if you kind of reverse the derivation of the path integral, which I didn't do, the forward derivation, so I'm not going to do the backwards derivation, but if you sort of reverse it, you find that the... The Green's function admits a more concrete formulation. Uh, this is just, uh, it's too much to digest, but the point is that everything on this slide you can cash out concretely. So um, it's written as a trace of some operator with respect to this uh, uh, you know, thermal state uh, of, of, our op of our Hamiltonian, and this, uh, the operator that we're taking the trace against is this so-called time-ordered uh, operator which it just means that if tau prime is less than tau, we do this, and if tau prime is greater than tau, we do this. And um, these AIs of tau are defined concretely uh, as these sort of kind of transformed creation uh, and annihilation operators. So the point is this is all concrete. So there's nothing mysterious, there's no Grassmann variables or anything kind of spooky. Um, and that's called the Matsubara Green's function. And there's many flavors of Green's functions due to the distinctions of real versus imaginary time, time ordering versus other conventions, of which there are several, zero versus finite temperature, et cetera, et cetera. There's really just a, a lot of variations on the same theme. But 
uh, I just want to point out that the form is very close already to something that can be accessed, that's the motivation for what can be accessed via experiment. So after you take this imaginary time business and analytically continue to real time, or if you prefer, just work in real time in the first place, and if you also like, just for simplicity, you don't like thermal states, work at zero temperature, then you recover in your expression for the Green's function uh, expressions like this, which have the physical interpretation of saying, in the ground state, psi naught, do a time evolution, uh, then uh, uh, I've, I've absorbed the chemical potential now into the Hamiltonian. So do a time evolution, add a particle at the jth site, uh, do some more time evolution uh, to get from time tau prime to tau, sorry, t prime to t, remove a particle from the i site, and then do some more time evolution to get to time t, and then uh, take the overlap of that with your initial state. This amplitude, it, it's kind of interpreted as measuring the amplitude of some physical process where a particle is introduced at the jth site at time tau t prime and removed at uh, uh, the ith site at time t. And this is usually the original like physical motivation for Green's function where you start from and you sort of reverse things. You find that you need to do this time ordering to get perturbative expansions, et cetera. So then the reverse direction is usually how things are motivated. Okay, I think I'll have just enough time. Great. Uh, so, okay, so let's now focus on the equilibrium case where G is a, it's, this kernel is a function only of time differences. So this will be the case, for example, if you have a static Hamiltonian. So in that case, this is fine, and more generally, uh, a frequency-dependent Hamiltonian, but that isn't, uh, that's equilibrium. It's not non-equilibrium. This will also be the case. So here, the Green's function, G, depends only on time differences, and it's antiperiodic. Uh, so it has this fermionic antiperiodicity um, uh, on the interval zero beta. And since it's an antiperiodic function of one variable on zero to beta, you can write it uh, you can represent it in terms of uh, uh, these values at Matsubara frequencies. So this is like an anti-periodic Fourier transform on integral, interval zero to beta. If you've never seen it before, and this is just an equivalent way of writing anti-periodic functions on an interval. It's in terms of these uh, this discrete set of values from going over the integers n. Uh, and these are called the Matsubara frequencies. And um, for simplicity even further, let's just consider the zero temperature scenario so here, the Matsubara frequencies fill the entire imaginary axis. And in principle, this function g, uh, here we have its values on uh, a grid for the imaginary axis. But we can think of it just generally as a rational function on the entire complex plane by analytic continuation. And um, similarly, we're going to consider kernels that satisfy uh, this property, that they're equilibrium in this, in this sense. And, uh, these can also be identified uh, as uh, functions of a complex variable z. So these are matrix-valued functions of, of a complex variable z. And in the static case, uh, the, this function, this a of z, is just z minus h. So z, so I've, I'm smushing the chemical potential into h. Z corresponds to the Fourier transform of partial tau, and h is just. Uh, uh, corresponds to the Fourier transform of H times the delta, equal time delta function. So, okay, in the static case, this A of Z just has this simple form. And uh, 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 I'll say a few more things so, before getting to the punchline. So in this case, uh, the static case, the Green's function can be written like so. So it just turns out that, uh, yeah, the Green's function can be written in this form. Um, and what's important for today is that it has a kind of analytic structure that defines what it means to be a so-called physical Green's function, which is that you can think of G of Z, it's a, it's a rational matrix-valued function with poles at, um, on the real axis. And for simplicity, we'll just consider a discrete set of poles, but there could be, a, you know, you could consider a, a, you know, a, a limit, basically the closure of this space where you have infinitely many poles. And the residues of the poles are matrix valued and they're positive definite matrices. And moreover, they sum up to the identity matrix. So the Green's function satisfies this, um, all these constraints. And uh, this is sometimes referred to as the saying that the Green's function is causal and uh, any physical Green's function ought to satisfy these constraints. Um, 
Interestingly, G, so this domain, is, corresponds precisely to the pointwise matrix inverses of functions in this inverse domain, which I'll call D inverse, which are functions of this form. So these are ma matrix valued uh, 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 rational functions uh, of a complex variable that have the form Z minus H, where H is just some Hermitian matrix, doesn't depend on Z, minus something that, again, is a sum of uh, kind of these, over these poles on the real axis, they could be different from the ones in the inverse. In fact, they will be uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the inverse function that's the pointwise inverse that corresponds to any one of these. But it still has a kind of similar structure. And uh, uh, again, these residues are positive definite, but they don't need to add up to one. And these are called, well, except there's a slightly special case of something called nevin linna functions, which appear, uh, interestingly, in recent work, using this structure to do analytic continuation from the imaginary axis to, uh, uh, to, the, to the more general rest of the complex plane for Green's functions, but also have a long history classically in the study of orthogonal polynomials and continued fraction, uh, re relate to conf continued fractions that arise also in this area, studying orthogonal polynomials that are perhaps matrix valued. And if you want, you can look at my dissertation for some self-contained proofs of these facts. Of, you know, that these domains are kind of inverses of one another. And, uh, okay, so in this non-interacting case, uh, G of the, the single particle Green's function is just A inverse. So it's just Z minus H inverse, point-wise. And we can define uh, self-energy, as we did before, not via a functional derivative, but via a Dyson equation, like so. So this is A, basically, this is difference of A and sigma, like before, has to be G inverse. So it means that uh, this difference, Z minus sigma, is one of these nevin linna functions. And uh, uh, that's satisfied by the true self-energy, just by this argument. Um, but if, if our, an ansatz for the self-energy, defined in terms of some bold diagrammatic expansion in G, preserves this property, we could say that the corresponding Green's function method is causal, which is a nice physical constraint to satisfy. It's not generically true, but it's true of many of your favorite methods, although it's not true of many of your other favorite methods. So some corrections to DMFT or DMFT with overlapping clusters. Um, but if it is true, then the Dyson iteration preserves the physical structure of Green's functions. So if I take a G, I, I have a causal self-energy, I take the Dyson iteration, I take this quantity and invert it pointwise, I get back something that lies in D again. And so my Dyson iteration doesn't leak out of this physical set, and this can be an important physical constraint to satisfy. Finally, we come relatedly to this question of the domain of the Ludinger Ward function, which we haven't even constructed. We're just going to guess what the domain ought to be. So what if we have no interaction, but the single particle kernel is not static? So in other words, we have, yeah, it's a non-interacting problem, but we're going to consider A that's not necessarily of the static form. So the fact that it's non-interacting means we can directly compute the Green's function. It's, it's just the pointwise inverse of A. And uh, since G is in D, if and only if A is in D inverse, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence then between uh, uh, single particle kernels that are frequency dependent A and G on their domains, which are D inverse and D respectively. So the non-interacting theory, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between A in this domain, D inverse, defining a, a frequency-dependent single particle Hamiltonian, and G uh, in D, defining a Green's function. That's physical, satisfying these physical constraints. So this D is the, will be the conjectural domain of the Ludinger Ward functional. Um, and we know at the non-interacting level that somehow everything works. There's this one-to-one -one correspondence. As long as we pick the right domain, the inverse for the frequency-dependent Hamiltonians. Now, what about if we add interaction? We don't know everything, but we can ask one thing, which is, is the resulting Green's function, if I have an uh, A that's in this class, is the resulting Green's function even physical? And it, it is, and this is why this is a, a hint about the, the domain. So it is. It turns out that for any A in this set, although it's mysteriously defined only via the path integral, in fact, it can be mapped onto a static Hamiltonian by uh, interpreting it as an open quantum system, which can be closed as an impurity problem. That's static, but larger. And, okay, maybe I have to skip some details, but 
If A is in this class, you can write it as something in this form where you have this leftover term that's called a hybridization. And just like before, uh, this hybridization can be interpreted as a sure complement uh, of some larger matrix. And this larger matrix corresponds to uh, a single particle, uh, a static single particle interaction on a large system with a fragment plus some extra bath orbitals. And then it turns out you can, in fact, recover the Green's function as a fragment block of uh, the Green's function for this larger impurity problem, which is defined by uh, these couplings V and uh, these uh, pole energies, epsilon. So uh, since you can view this uh, frequency-dependent small problem as basically a block of a static large problem, that this physical structure of the Green's function is still satisfied. So if you just restrict the Green's function of this block, the physical structure will still be satisfied. And so then we have this conjecture, which is that you fix the interaction. We hope there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between frequency-dependent single-particle Hamiltonians in D inverse and Green's functions in D. So we know that for any A here, you, you do map into this domain. So that's good. We just, so we have the right domain and the right codomain. That's already kind of non-trivial. But we don't know if you're injective or surjective. Uh, and of course, with these domains, I really mean their closures, perhaps with infinitely many, a limit of infinitely many poles. And there's been a lot of interesting work kind of saying why this isn't true. But uh, in spite of all this work, to the best of my knowledge, and after some conversations with leading experts in the field, there is um, still. I should say also that even though I don't think this has been resolved, it's not necessarily that I expect it to be true. It's just that nobody knows. And the reason is that apparently all the apparent counterexamples produced so far involve quantities G and A that lie outside these physical domains. So they don't necessarily contradict this conjecture. I haven't seen the conjecture stated anywhere, but it seems that it's not surprising to anyone. And at this point, I think it's unknown whether this is true or false. And if you can tell me, then that would be great. So I would just like to acknowledge Lynn, my collaborator on basically all this work, NSF. And uh, I'll just put up some references for your perusal. Uh, so when I say easy mode, I mean for a mathematical audience. And hard mode is also for a mathematical audience. The stuff I wrote should be uh, pleasant for you if you're a mathematician. So I hope that you enjoy it. And you can learn something from it. That's what it's for. It's precisely for this kind of tutorial. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot for your attention.